In this episode, I'm going to make a boatload of clip-ons, a really cool looking dance floor, another gargoyle, and I'm going to revisit some progress that I've already made. Because hey, I'm not applying Six Sigma here. Although, that would make for riveting content. Applying Six Sigma to your D&D crafting. Where's my notebook? Hey everyone, Wylock here. Thanks for joining me. Part 3. Today we continue our journey to build the entire Tomb of Horrors. Not a lot of preamble, I'll just say, I assume you've watched previous parts, and I'll always make that assumption. So I'm not going to revisit, like, how I build tiles and how I paint them. I've showed that already, and I should be able to just say, here's a room that I built. Only the new elements are what I'll dive into detail on. So without further ado, let's dive in. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. We left off in room 8 with the gargoyle, so let's go to the text and check out room 9. The small room beyond the door is empty and appears to have no other exits. So this is just a cluster of small rooms connected by a whole bunch of doors, and some shenanigans going on with a bolt trap that doesn't need to be modeled. Okay, a lot of grunt work to be done here with these many small rooms and secret doors, but I am not going to abstract it. I committed to do this thing, no compromise, as drawn, as written. What else can I say? Rip and tear until it is done. First up, good old fashioned 45 minute blitz to get all these tiles built and painted. And then for all those secret doors, here's how I've decided to handle them. I make a standalone small clip, the body of which is only a quarter inch tall. So this is a standard clip-on blank, except it's just really, really small. And then the slab of wall that has moved out of the way is just some double corrugated cardboard hot glued on there. Notice the corrugation is running up and down. That allows the hot glue to really seep into the bottom and make this a very strong connection. I know it doesn't look like it, but it really is. Here it is done, painted up, and you can see it is built to withstand some manhandling, right? It is very durable. I'm going to clip it on here and I can actually hold up the tile by the secret door. Cool. One other consideration for building the tiles. Now I had to account for the fact that the party could be coming from either direction. It technically is possible to come through room 10 first and then into this series of secret rooms. So I prepared for the worst case scenario. First, the inner cluster of four rooms. Let's assume that the outer rim hasn't been discovered yet. So I built the tiles with walls such that those could be discovered independently. Then I took those away and assumed that the players were coming from room 8. So I designed and built enough tiles of the right shape with the right walls to wrap all the way around and get to room 10. Then I imagined that they were coming from room 10 to room 8. So I rearranged those tiles and it turns out I only needed one extra hallway in order to be prepared for this scenario. So I'm ready for any combination of those cases. They can all be built independently. And in fact, here they are. And this again demonstrates the power of the one and a quarter inch grid. You can fit a one inch miniature on any of those game spaces. The grid is preserved and not offset. So now let's move on to something a little more fun. Right now the room I've been waiting for, number 10, the Great Hall of Spheres. This area is similar to area three for the floor is of inlaid tiles. Similar to room three, inlaid stones. I, I don't want to do this again. This took like three hours and in the grand scheme of things as crafting goes, that's not a long time, but it was so tedious and I hate it and the reward is so, there's got to be a better way. I decided to go print and paste. So there's a really cool site that I go to a lot called Genetica, or Genetica, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it has tons of free textures you can download for your personal use. So I found a cool one, brought it into Photoshop, duplicated it, rotated it randomly, messed with the hue, and gave it a bevel and emboss. So this I printed up and applied with glue stick. Five minutes and it looks great. At the south end of the room is this magic archway. As you come close, three stones in the archway in front of you begin to glow. The left hand base stone shines with an olive hue, the one on the right with citron, or citron, I don't know how to pronounce that. And the keystone seven feet overhead gives off russet light. Those are random color choices. This misty archway is identical to the one from room three, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. 
Only difference is the colors, the olive, citron, and russet. And I do spritz the polyfill pretty heavily with flat sealant to really crisp it up, keep it in place, make it durable, and make it cuttable. Not a whole lot more to say about that. I needed to build it. I built it, and it's done. So the book talks about these vibrant, colorful paintings of humanoid figures interacting with the colored spheres up on all the walls, covering all the walls. Now, I don't know how to draw. I don't really want to hit Google image search for this. So what did I do? Magic the Gathering cards. Yes, perfect. And it's pretty much the right scale, too. So I'm not burning uncommons or rares. These are just commons. I just cut out the artwork, and I tried to pick pieces of art that showed it almost the full body as opposed to a close-up. So I cut those out and simply glued them to a clip-on blank. Hand-painted all the spheres with my acrylic craft paints, according to the description in the book. And I also tried to pick art where it looks like a hand was open or they're like they're interacting with something and I would paint the sphere there. I also hit these with some flat crystal clear sealant to kill that nasty gloss and also seal down that acrylic craft paint. Those dots will scrape right off. So here's a bunch of them clipped on, not in the correct order, but just here for demonstration. One thing I learned later on, don't hot glue the magic cards to cardboard. They're very slick and they'll pop off. Use white PVA glue. So it was about 45 minutes start to finish to make all 20 of those clip-ons. All right, so those came out pretty sweet. I'm really happy with those. Next, uh, You know, I was never happy with the walls of these. The book talks about colorful paintings up on the wall of various scenes, and I did these this black and white pattern that repeats itself. I think I've stumbled upon a way to make that better, and it's easy to retrofit, so uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and revisit that for room three. So yeah, again, I just picked some evocative art that might be on the walls of a Tomb of Horrors and attached them over top the existing wall just using some glue stick. Yeah, that is much more colorful. I think it's much truer to what the book is talking about. Looks a little bit eclectic, but I mean, it's better than it was before, so I'm happy. Nice. All right, that feels so much better. Now, where were we? Room 10. Although... So now if the Anubis things holding the box are in black and white, that doesn't make sense because the walls are a vibrant in color. So I decided to go ahead and revisit this as well. Sort of consulting the 5th edition imagery to get a basic idea for what colors I'm going to go after. And then I imported the original artwork to Photoshop and just did some colorization there. Printed it out and glued it onto a clip-on blank, just like the first one. Some of you noted that the brass box does protrude from the wall, so this is an opportunity to do a little something extra. I just made a ledge and a box out of some bits of chipboard, stuck on some gems, again kind of referring to the 5th edition artwork, and painted it up bronze followed by a soft tone wash. So here's the before, and here's the after. Okay, done. Now, room 10. The... I was never really happy with the green devil face either. You recall I had a really hard time making it. Well, I stumbled across something after breakfast the other day. Look at the top half of this egg carton. Kind of looks like mouths. So I'm going to extract them, and this is a very cheap, fragile paper pulp, so I'm going to slather it with a nice coat of Mod Podge to harden it up. And I'm doing this on my new Sherbonder silicone mat. Love this thing, saved my cutting mat. And then I really like this image back from the original module artwork, with that large gold copper wall behind it and that radiating pattern or whatever. So I made a much larger clip-on blank for this one. I cut out some holes for the eyes and hot glued in some beads behind it. And again, the nose I sculpted out of hot glue, just like the original try. And for that pattern on the wall, I'm gonna use food box cardstock. I just measured out the shapes and cut them out with an X-Acto knife. That I attached with glue stick, and then hot glued on the face. The large open areas at the top and bottom, I just covered with some cardstock. At this point, just for good measure, another nice layer of Mod Podge over everything, including those horns, which haven't been primed yet. 
While I was at it, I made the two other heads that are going to appear in room 25 much later on. But while I'm doing this with the egg carton, it's useful to production line things. I'll set those aside. We'll see them in a future video. And from there, I painted it up pretty much as I did the first time. On the wall, it's a metallic gold, then a shade, then a dry brush. So here's the before. And here is the after. So here is room three revisited. And isn't it so much cooler looking? Here it was at the end of part one. And here it is now in part three. Actually, now I'm kind of looking at the floors. You know, I must say, I, I like how this looks so much that it makes me wonder if I should revisit my tile for room three. Okay, no more going backwards. Let's go look at the northwest corner of room 10. This small room holds what appears to be a statue of a gargoyle eight feet tall with four arms. One of the arms is broken off and lies on the floor in front of the statue. And it looks like it's connected to room 10 via a crawlway. It's like a very small tunnel. For these crawlways, I'm treating them differently than like hidden passages, like the crawl space that we had in part two. So these are going to be, I think, naturally earthen dug tunnels, just based on the way they're drawn on the map with the squiggly lines and all. It also just gives some aesthetic variety to everything on the table. So the standard I had committed to is my one space wide hallways would be on just 2D chipboard. So that's what I'm using. First I measure out my one and a quarter inch grid, pencil on where I know the path is going to go just to help me visualize it. And to paint, it's two coats of French vanilla to give a nice solid base coat. And then with a cinnamon type of color or sienna, kind of side strike at it to create streaks which sort of hint at where the pathway is going. And then that exact same technique, but with a dark brown. Actually, it's not a brownie brown. It's, it's like a walnut, very desaturated sort of dark brown. And then lastly, with a very rich chocolatey bark, I think this is called bark brown, watered it down a lot to a wash and applied that. This will return some nice color, some nice saturation. And from there, I just freehanded, blacked out the edges or the walls. So that leads into this little 10 by 20 room. Pretty easy to do. Only difference with this one is I needed to leave a gap in the wall that's one inch where that crawlway ends and meets up with it. For the gargoyle, well, I already built one of these for room eight. I don't have that exact body again, but I can make something that looks kind of close. So that's what I did. Back to my leftover Tyranid bits and kit bashed it together. This one actually came out, I, I like it a lot better. I, I actually put horns on the head. I think that's important for a gargoyle look. And then the way those legs double back, I, I forget what that's called, that double jointed knees or whatever, just makes it a little truer to the source artwork. And you can see the broken off arm is lying there on the ground in front of it. Let us look at the entire dungeon so far with everything we've built, except for the two false entrances. I don't really feel the need to show those anymore. Quick note about room 10, uh, it's a huge tile, so I split it in two, and this one is actually two equal halves, and what that does is splits it in the middle of a 10-foot space so that I could use clip-ons there because I knew there were going to be some to hold them together. Also, this crawlway that goes underneath the room, well, it literally goes underneath the room because, again, I did those on 2D chipboard. Completely unnecessary, but so is all of this. I don't know why I'm doing this, because it's fun, I suppose. And I've really been researching and practicing with my DSLR camera here, so hopefully you guys have noticed a difference lately, I'm trying to bring in much more beautiful video quality. Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again, when something is beyond your artistic reach, print and paste is an awesome way to go. And coming up here down the line is a couple of false doors. They're actually trapped, just using my normal doors that I covered in part two. I know that what you're looking at, this style is not for everyone. It's not gritty or dusty or grimy at all. Totally get that. But lately I've just been really interested in color. What can I say? It's my terrain. And we'll get another close up look at the gargoyle here. By the way, I've since looked it up and the correct term for those legs is digitigrade or it might be ungulligrade. It's one of those two. Man, I am tempted to redo the gargoyle in room eight. Uh, I'm really worried I'm gonna do it. 
There is this winding crawlway that leads to room 14, and there's another crawlway that I haven't made yet, so you don't see it. Another quick look at room 9, and I say good riddance to thee. That was not necessarily fun to make, but here it is rendered accurately. And while we're at it, one final look at room 3 following its makeover. You know, I might end up applying a brown wash to those walls just to dull them down a bit, make it more ancient without losing the color and the wonder of it. But yeah, the single most exciting thing for me out of this session was the egg carton for the green devil face. Well, this has been a very productive couple of nights here. This project's coming along nicely. I hope you're enjoying the series. I'm trying to present the project as it unfolds. So that means warts and all. And if I go backwards, I go backwards. Um, just basically documenting everything that I'm doing as opposed to doing a tutorial. And let's be honest, I'm probably going to go back and revisit the gargoyle in room 8. As always, tons of resources in the video description below, especially if you're new to this whole thing. And if you're not a member of the Tabletop Crafters Guild on Facebook, I do hope that you'll come check us out and join us. But until then, if you're enjoying this series, then here's two more videos that I think you'll like. Until I see you next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games. Thank <laughs> you.